Well, today we have Nagarjuna with us. Hello, Nagarjuna. Hi, Rahasya. How are you doing today? I'm doing pretty good. I'd, uh, personally, I'd like to know a lot more about satsang. I've done a few satsangs, and um, it didn't quite click. I think I was probably trying to analyze it too much as I was going along. Uh, how, how do you handle somebody that, that's using their mind a little bit too much? So satsang is a movement from the mind into the heart, so to speak. So literally speaking, satsang is, is a meeting together to talk about truth. And uh, the ultimate satsang talks about the ultimate truth. And the ultimate truth is the truth of the beingness, of the, the very essence of our own self, which is present always in each and every one of us. <clears throat> and uh, of course, the essence cannot be reached by an effort of made by thought or the intellect or the mind trying to analyze it and get it. So, satsang is an environment that somehow provokes the light of the beingness to come and surface and, uh, and naturally the noise aspect of the mind subsides with, with the rising of, of the, the being or the self or the heart. So those are all words that they are pointers. They point to something but they don't mean much and we should never get hold of a pointer because that could be misleading as well. So we, when you say that there's no effort involved, that's no effort involved on the part of the person that's listening to you, but that also means there's no effort on your part either. You know, what, what, what do you do? Just sort of like hold the space? There is no effort at all from any 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 part in a satsang. The thoughts in satsang have to be very spontaneous and natural. It has to come from silence itself. If it comes from the mind, it does not have the same effect. It does not have the same power to to steal the mind and to create a space in which the self rises by itself or the heart opens automatically and that feeling of peace that comes with, with a mind that is still and, uh, and, uh, and the revelation of the self shining through as just pure presence, pure beingness without touching any concept. It naturally flows when the satsang is genuine, when the satsang is not something prepared out of uh, notes or uh, knowledge file it in the memory system of a, of a certain individual. Such sound must be a thought happening, springing from silence itself to have its form. And, uh, and within that kind of environment, maybe you had an experience of such sound that did not cause the effect that was meant to cause. And there could be many different reasons, but uh, I believe if you would try it again for a few times or if we ever make an intensive down there in California, I'm pretty much sure that you will understand very, very well the language of satsang, which is the language of silence, or the language of the heart. Well, I, I, I think possibly I, I might be getting close to this. Uh, it's been a few years since I've done a satsang. And, and here recently, I've been delving into oh, the, the holographic universe kind of information. And what they're figuring out is that we really don't have control over our reality. It, it comes to us from a different level. And I think this is really important to understand for people like me because we are so bombarded by the secret and positive thinking and Norman Vincent Peale and we get all into this because our ego really likes to think that it has some control 
even as a co-creator. We, we can even be co-creators with God if we want to. But as the science is coming out, it's appearing more and more like we don't have control. And this is a more of a holographic projection that we have to surrender to. So even scientists right now are saying that we need to handle our reality in a different kind of a way than what Western society has traditionally done. So you have, you have touched so many topics in there. So when you talk in terms of, uh, of uh, having a certain power to, to control your reality or to manipulate your reality, we are talking of a phenomenal appearance in consciousness itself. So all realities out there, they are projections of the mind. The mind projects everything through language, with the use of language, and through the power of intellect of uh, giving names, definitions, and notions to whatsoever is in life. The whole construct of life is a construct made by thought. And that is a very complex phenomenon. And everybody is plugged in into that. Yeah, what's funny is you're using some of the same terminology as some of the, the brightest, most intelligent physicists on the planet are using. They're, they're also saying that we, with our minds, we're picking up a uh, from the field behind us and we're projecting our reality. But we're not as in control of that projection as we once thought we were. Of course not. And it's nobody, it's all happening by itself, and it's all within the realm of illusion. This is all a holographic projection, it's a phenomenon in reality. When we meet in satsang, we don't want to, to entertain much the holographic phenomenon appearance within consciousness. The invitation in satsang, when satsang becomes really hot, really to the point, is of invitation of turning the attention of consciousness towards its own background into which every phenomenal appearance is appearing to. It's the analogy of the, the screen in the cinema hall where every picture is appearing to is the most precise, the most beautiful one and simple to understand the nature of awareness because any and every appearance in consciousness is appearing to that awareness, we see that awareness, and it can never ever touch or stay, stay in that awareness. It does not affect the awareness at all. The awareness is absolutely untouched by anything that appears within its, its view, it's in its reflection, its own projection. It's the screen in the cinema hall is the awareness, and that is the nature of consciousness within the human condition. And the invitation of such sign is to let alone all the complexity of the manifest phenomenon. Because we start the journey usually with a movement of withdrawing from the materialistic <coughs> aspect of, of the human condition, meaning to say, we no longer are going totally fascinated by having five cars and ten houses and three wives and uh, a jet. So we start learning that those things, those objects, they come and they don't deliver the satisfaction that we have project upon them. So by, by maturity, we start understanding that none of those objects are going to give us true happiness and peace and contentment. So we start withdrawing from those, from, from that attraction towards those objects, and we start becoming interested in all other objects, more subtle, we start exploring our sensations, our emotions, and then we start exploring our mind, our thoughts, our mental pattern, our reactions, our emotional reactions, so we, we keep looking into those. And, and a lot of people also, uh, those having a lot of inclination for, for knowledge, 
acquired knowledge or information, you know, they they let alone the materialistic world and they go into books. Books I can see behind you there. They can read libraries and libraries and accumulate so much information, you know. But there is no information that can deliver the same sense of peace, love, and happiness. The same way, no new relationship, no beautiful new house, no new car, no bank account with millions of dollars will ever deliver that happiness. The same way, all the information contained in every book, in all the books in the world, are never going to deliver true satisfaction and happiness. Yeah, here late here lately, I've I've had to reevaluate what what intelligence is, and it's taken me a lot of years and a, the accumulation of a lot of information to even come to this conclusion. But it it doesn't seem like if you have all of the information at, at your disposal and you have it all right there, it doesn't really help you handle the important aspects of life. And the conclusion I've come to is that true intelligence is being available and accessing just the information you need for that point in time. Because tomorrow, it, it might require a whole different set of information for the exact same instance because the world changes and people change and we evolve and grow. A and being in resonance with just the information you need seems to be what the intelligence is that I'm seeking now. Right. So you see, things become very complicated when you want to operate from your mind. You know, you, you start to understand how difficult it is to, to, to connect with this, this higher intelligence so that you can have a deeper understanding on, on, on the challenges and problems and situations of life. When we want to operate through the mind, things are extremely complex. But in reality, we don't need any information. It's not a question of, uh, I trust that the right piece of information is going to show up. We don't need any information. We don't need to access any files of information in our mind, in our brain, in our system. We can just leave it all alone, not even touch it. Because when we touch it, we are always under that you know, tension of, uh, am I going to say the right thing? Am I going to find the right answer here? You know, am, am I looking? There will be always doubt, always doubt. Okay? So when you operate from the mind, <clears throat> you, can, you can strategize, you can put it yourself, get yourself together, but anything can, can push you a little off, you know, and then you expose by being someone who's coming from a standpoint of mental understanding. And uh, when you live alone, every information, every knowledge that the world out there can pass to you and turn into the self-discover of the very one, the knower of all information, the knower that does not depend on any information, the moment that the knower gets to know himself as knower, knower becomes being as Noah and being is the same thing. And when Noah becomes the being, no longer attached to people, things, and place, and information, the Noah becomes being. And as a being, a very, very incredible phenomenon happens. The mind surrenders, the mind slows down, the mind becomes still. And that, that, that monkey phenomenon that keep jump from one argument to another trying to get things figured out. It somehow subsides, comes down. And then magically what happens is that mind, because there isn't any more that background of noise leaking the energy of the beingness, the energy of the self is leaking through all that noise, all those that schizophrenic movements in the beingness, of so many different voices calling for attention, you know? It drives one insane. When that subsides, and then the mind becomes pure, and then you become wiser, 
you have answers for things without having to consult any file within your memory system. You just see things clearly about anything. You don't need to start anything to, to me to see things from a clear point of view. Yeah, e e even now sitting here, I, I see my mind stepping out in front of you a little bit, trying to think of the next thing to say or the next response instead of just letting it be and that's that's where we miss the moment the point of this interview is to to expose my thoughts through the internet through your magazine but it's also uh, the purpose is to create the silence of such time where beingness where pure purity of the heart can be experienced by you and by anybody else who's going to be watching this video. I heard you say something once about absolute truth. What, what do you mean by absolute truth? So when I was young, I used to think that uh, everybody have their own truth. I have my truth, somebody else has their truth, and nobody should mess with anybody else's truth, otherwise there will be conflict, you know? So leave my truth alone and I don't touch your truth, therefore I don't conflict with you and I won't. Because uh, we, we want to keep our truth intact. We don't want anybody challenging our truth or creating any discomfort that could bring doubt to our own truth. So therefore we, try, we tend to look for people in place that somehow support our mental construct so that we don't feel challenged, we don't have anything questioning our identity as our mental construct. So this is what I can call relative truth, okay? The relative truth could be like, I am my body. I know my body change every day, every, every month, every year. The body of the little child when he was two years old and the body of the, of the 18 years old boy has no relationship between one another. It reacts different, moves different, it looks different. So it's completely different. Body is something that for sure it's the clearest of the of the phenomenal appearance in consciousness that we can by the discrimination of the intellect we can describe and say, I know I'm not the body. Okay? <clears throat> so this is again a relative truth, a truth of denial, I'm not this, I'm not my mind. So we can go and meet together in satsang and keep addressing phenomenal appearance in consciousness as a way to deny reality to those appearances. Meaning to say, I'm not the body, I'm not my emotions, the emotions may be a shadow reflection of my beingness due to this tight identification of consciousness with the body and the mind emotions come into place because body, mind creates sensations in the, in, the, in the body organism. So we are not the emotions, so and then we can talk a lot about emotions in such time. Either way, not to reinforce the identification of consciousness with its emotional body, but as a means to, to clarify consciousness, that consciousness you have attached yourself to your emotional body and therefore you feel as if the emotional body is yourself but you are not your emotional body and then we can go looking through details do, do you think words have a lot of power Nagarjuna as far as if I say I am sad is there a different way to approach that to where I'm not so identified with I am sad uh, words have an incredible power, but let me let me carry on my line here. So, the relative truth can also come to the point of uh, of, uh, of talking about our programming, our mental conditioning, our mental structure. So, consciousness is so identified to the body, to the mind, to the emotions, and even more identified as as this sequential phenomena of thoughts that create the sense of being someone as what I think. So that is the most intimate of identification of consciousness with an object appearing. It is its own mental process. 
So we can spend a lot of time talking about those mental processes. And we can call that satsang. And it can be a relative talk about truth because the same way the body, the mind, the emotions, and the mental process, they are all shadow aspects of the truth, the absolute truth of who we are. That which we are is the permanent principle in consciousness within the human condition that has been through all the stages of life, the little babe, newborn, all the way until its moment of departure from this realm in a lifetime. So there is a principle that is permanent. Everything else is impermanent, but it gives a sensation of, uh, of being an extension of myself is, is my mental process. It's the ideas I have about myself. It's what I think, my actions. All of that are extensions it's, and extensions, almost as if it would be a reflection of the true being, you know, within yeah. the human condition. You know, as you're talking about this, it reminds me of a poem by Rumi. And he goes through a lot of building up to this, but he, at the end of the poem he says that he will meet us in the field. And, and I think the field that he's talking about is close to what you're talking about, where we meet in this, this field past the illusion, past the maya, past all the intellect and the emotions and the body. And I, I think it's really difficult, I, I'm speaking from my point of view, it's difficult for my mind to be in consciousness without thinking about it. Like, as I go into a meditation, I, I can momentarily go into consciousness, even reflective consciousness, where the thing that's usually looking out runs out of things to look at, think about, feel, and then it turns back on itself and the moment that it does that, my mind jumps in there and goes, ah, I'm there, and then I'm gone. Absolutely. If I could yeah. just hold on to that without words. Yeah. So, you know, it's uh, the self shines through when we don't touch any concept. When we meditate, sometimes the meditator forgets himself. You know, the meditator is itself the impediment for the light of consciousness to shine through freely and express its bliss of being as such that another no existence consciousness bliss. So the meditator has to forget himself for those flash of the self shine through. And whenever it comes, it happens. And then the mind is very tricky to reestablish itself again by saying like, oh I got it. And the moment that the mind comes back, kicks in again and then and then that little hole, that little crack in this thick wall of thoughts that creates a sense of a separate individual self. There is a little crack and then light goes through and then it the crack closes again because the mind says, I got it. Now I'm gonna get enlightened. You know? And the truth is nobody has ever got enlightened and nobody will ever get enlightened. There is no such a thing. The, the very thicker, the, 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 the meditator, the thicker, has to dissolve, has to erode to a point where the, the crack, this wall of thoughts, becomes a big hole and then consciousness starts shining through. Once it shines through, one starts experiencing oneself as consciousness rather than a, a mental process with the body. So once consciousness starts expressing itself, freely through that crack, that hole, it's, there is this experience of bliss, love, and peace. Yeah, you know, this, this brings up one of my obstacles in this following this path has been, I've always said that I want to wake up. And it's only been the last year or so that I've realized that I will never wake up. As a matter of fact, I can't be there when this process happens and it sort of reminds me there's a parable in the Bible where they're talking about the gardeners doing the cooking and the cook is doing the laundry and everybody's doing different jobs and the the crux of this parable is that 
within that household, they have to pick out one person that is the steward. And he is dictating to the gardener, you do the gardening, the cook, you do the cooking, putting everybody in their place. And he is the person that's going to answer the door when the master knocks. And the most important part about this parable is that the person that was picked to be the steward has to be willing to give up his job when the master knocks. He, he's no longer in charge. So always keep that in mind that I've, I've had to find a part of myself, I, I hate to use the word sacrifice, but there, there's a part of myself that I've had to find that's willing to put my life, put my mind in order, put everything in place, and be willing to sacrifice and surrender itself at that moment of confrontation with consciousness. So but first you need to put your, your life in order, is that what you're saying? Yeah, it, I might be playing another trick on, with my mind, I, I know, but... Mind is going to do everything to maintain itself in power, you know, to keep the dream, the illusion going. It's going to pull any numbers, you know, I need to save the world, I need to save other people first, I need to to create life circumstances to be perfect to myself and my family. So what would you and say to me right now? What should I do? If we were in satsang, which so in you, a sense, I guess we are. You are in satsang and my, my, my advice to you is come as often as possible to satsang. So find satsang, true satsang. Satsang is accelerated ripening. We go through, we, we, we progress in spirituality by following our dreams and seeing our dreams being crashed over and over again. We follow our delusions and then by direct first-hand experience we realize I have been chasing these and that and now knowledge, information, understanding through the mind, everything I have been doing is not bringing me to a peace of mind that I have been searching for, that the sage talk about, you know. Well, so you can have your life circumstance, you can fix your life circumstance to a degree that you have all the money, you have the car, the, the house, and the, the perfect relationship with your wife, everything is in place, which is impossible, by the way, because it's in the nature of every appearance in consciousness is that it changes. Everything is changeable. Everything changes all the time. There is no circumstance that ha can be frozen and say, this is the ideal circumstance, and then you freeze it. It's the nature of life is nice and change. The only thing that does not change is change itself, because change is eternal. So, but even if, if hypothetically you could freeze things in a most perfect condition for you, you will not be happy, you know? Right. And by having the direct experience of getting what you want and not getting the happiness and the peace and the love that you, you heard about, once you hear about the true peace, love and contentment of the state of the self, and then you cannot be deceived by those momentary sense of pleasure that comes from acquiring some objects of desire. You know, you heard that there is some talk, some, your teacher Osho has spoke many times about the state and how does that feel. So once you heard that, you cannot be deceived to settle for a flat, boring, dry sense of peace. Well, we'll have, to, we'll have to see what we can do about getting you down to our area of Northern California. And I'll come to one of your set songs and try to leave some of my intellectual tools at home and uh, check it out again. Well, you, you all start from where you are at and whatsoever is your, your situation is the entryway, you know. So you are a very intellectual person and I know you. So it's through the intellect. You cannot think of Rahasya going to the Bhakti way and from one day to another become a Bhakti guy and going to devotion and surrender and submission. It's not your inclination, you know. You have been an uh, uh, intellectual 
entity, person, for most probably forever. So you need to use the tool that you have in hand, which is the ability to discriminate through the intellect, but use it properly. Use it not to perpetuate the dream, the delusion, but use it to verify if there is any fundament on those concepts that you keep holding so tightly, so dearly, as if it is your very, very nature, your very, very identity, and as if by holding on to those concepts, you're going to arrive to a point of true happiness. So you have to use the very intelligence that you have into your favor rather than against you. You really? should never trust your mind. Mind is never going to take you to realization, to the true happiness of the being. Yeah, I'm finally coming to that conclusion. It's only taken me about 60 years, but... Yeah, it comes when it comes, and it's so beautiful to see it coming. Yeah. You know? And, uh, and, and satsang, again, is a celebration of the process of maturity, of ripening. So you accelerate, you start intensifying that process, pro and you start cruising through your delusions more quickly, faster, you know? You well, that's, start that sounds faster. good to me. That sounds really good to me because I, I think most people, a lot of people at least, get to a point in their lives where nothing's working anyway. I mean, it doesn't matter what I do, what I say, what I learn, or how much I learn. I'm no more happier today than I have been at times in my life standing on a beach with no money, no direction, and absolutely nothing happening. And looking back, some of those times were the, the happiest times of my life. And I've talked to really some wealthy, powerful people that all they do at this point in their life is think back to the early days when they lived in their van and parked down at the beach. And now here they are sitting in their big houses with their Cadillacs or whatever it is they're driving. And they're, they're, they have everything that they've ever worked for. But at this point, they're in their minds thinking back to those early days and um Absolutely. that's why um uh, my my dearest teacher Sri Nisagadatta Maharaj he always invites us to recede to this child principle you know because the piece the piece of that uh, of this friend that you have associated with that are um, multi-millionaires when they remember those early days when they were in their twenties and their twenties and they were free to to have parties at the beach, there was there, it's, there was a very relative but strong sense of lightness of, of uh, freedom, you know, because they were not entangled in the world and the world I mean is the world in here, okay? What is created outside is just a reflection. They were more innocent, they were closer to the nature state. So, Nisargadatta Maharaj often invites us to, to recede back to the child principle at the age of two or three when we were completely innocent. Jesus was meant to have said similar things, you know? Be innocent like a newborn child or a three years old child, you know? Yep. So, before the mind, has created this entanglement of concepts. Yeah, he, he, he talks several times by saying things like, don't worry about tomorrow, look at the sparrows, they don't worry about tomorrows, the grass grows by itself. And I, I, think, I think this whole planet is approaching that point to where we're all ready to surrender to something else because we're starting to see that no matter what we do, we can't seem to make it right. Something has to happen, and it always reminds me of a quote by Einstein. He said that we're never going to come up with the solutions from the same level of consciousness that created the problems. We're looking for a new level of consciousness, a new level of awareness, not more information, not more fix-its. We're, we're at, the, at the edge of a precipice where we're like up against a... a a wall and we need a whole nother level of consciousness so hopefully things like this is what's reaching out into the world now making a change uh, you well said you said everything I hope that comes from your true true uh, 
silence our beingness everything you spoke because if that comes from it, it means the seed is really well planted in there when you say that uh, that we need to to shift we need we are never going to find a solution from the same mind that has created the problem in the same plan, plan in the first place because the mind is the cause of the problem well then, so then we need to shift into a different state then i'm going to quit while i'm ahead 